Glory to Ukraine. Today is October 6 of 2022. It is the 225th day of us countering the covertly full-scale aggression of the Russian Federation on the territory of Ukraine. I would like to welcome you here at the Military Media Center as a weekly briefing of the Ukrainian Security and Defense Forces on the events on the front lines of the Russian-Ukrainian war. And we are here to also deliver you the security situation in Ukraine. Briefing will have the following participants. The Deputy Minister of Defense of Ukraine, Ms. Hanna Maler, Deputy Head of the Main Operations Directorate of the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, Brigadier General Luxi Hromov, Acting Director of the Implementation Planning Department, of the Main Directorate of the National Guard of Ukraine, Colonel Mykola Ushalovich. Head of the Cyber Police Department of the National Police of Ukraine, Colonel Yuri Vukhadets. I would like to give the floor first to Ms. Hanna Maler. Ma'am. Good afternoon, friends. We are here today starting our regular briefing of the Defense and Security Forces. We're together on all front lines, including the informational front line. It is the 225th day of Ukrainian defense. Meter by meter, we are liberating Ukrainian land and returning blue and yellow flags on our administrative buildings. Our defenders are responding to the cowardly decisions of the ter ter terroristic Kremlin government on referendums and their results. Russians are not quite eager to fight a war in Ukraine. A testament to that are more than 2,000 calls to the hotline I want to live that we presented here last week. In the first few weeks of this project, you can see that there are quite a few of those Russians willing to call on that hotline. They're asking how they should become a prisoner of war. It is the right decision as Ukraine guarantees that we will abide by all of the norms of international humanitarian law. Starting from February 24th, we quite actively try to inform Russian troops and Belarusian troops preventively how they can become a prisoner of war, how they can surrender, and we have carried out a few of such media campaigns and we continue to systematically work on this. I would like to also announce a very important event. On October 20th, 21st, we will have a National Defense Hackathon of 2022. Ukrainian experts, together with the representatives of our partner nations, will work on innovative solutions that will help the armed forces of Ukraine to achieve technological advantage over the enemy. National Defense Hackathon of 2022 will be organized by the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, together with the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine as well as the National Coordination Center of Cybersecurity, Center of Countering Disinformation, with the support of the uh, Civil Studies Fund um, of U.S. and Ukraine, State Department of U.S. and NATO. We have invited cyber NATO cyber experts to the hackathon, as well as experts from our ally countries, such as Poland, Great Britain, U.S., Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and other EU nations. In order to participate in this hackathon or to become a member of a team, you have to visit the website Hackathon Melgov UA. The deadline of application submission is October 15th, and on that website you can find more detailed information regarding the hackathon. Over the course of the week, the security situation around Ukraine remained complicated but controlled. With the framework of mobilization, uh, the Russian Federation started to establish formations of territorial forces that can be deployed on annexed territories in order to support the occupational regimes. The adversary starts to actively deploy reserve forces uh, along the Donetsk and Southern Buch operational areas. The overall numbers, according to the main Department of Intelligence, oh, I'm sorry, that my mistake, According to the information provided by the main intelligence department, the overall number of Russian troops deployed over this week increased up to 177 battalion tactical groups. 
The partial mobilization in Russia was a way to actually show the real attitude of the population towards the endeavors of the government. A large number of men who are subject to draft in order to escape the mobilization ran away abroad or trying to uh, use bribes. Some individuals have hurt themselves or have faked special psychiatric uh, diagnosis in order to avoid being drafted. Also, as it turned out, the Ministry of Defense of Russian Federation is unable to successfully support mobilization efforts. Therefore, most of equipment the mobilized individuals have to purchase by themselves. The training of the mobilized individuals was very brief or they were deployed right away from drafting centers. We know instances of the mobilized individuals being killed in action or ending up as POWs. Russian military command against the successful counteroffensive of the Ukrainian troops is using the practice of burning the bodies of those Russians killed in action in order to hide the numbers of actual losses of the Russian troops. On the temporary occupied Ukrainian territories, Russian occupying, occupying forces, after the illegal referendums, have strengthened the administrative pressure on the local population by adjusting all areas of life to Russian legislation. Russians have started to nationalize local infrastructure and property and subjected to the so-called local administration government. Individuals who disagree with this nationalization are threatened with criminal uh, punishment and being sent to prisons on the territory of Russian Federation. For a number of times we have already said that the occupying forces are trying to integrate the education into Russian education field and as of today the temporarily occupied territories Local educational institutions are hearing demands from Russian troops to present Russian history and Russian version of history to the Ukrainian students. For example, in Zaporizhia, the educational institutions have received an order that obligates the teachers to conduct propaganda classes of Russian world to students and to justify the referendums to the population and children. In order to carry out this project, special propaganda uh, messages were prepared. Traditionally, during these briefings, we talked to you about the support of the armed forces. And as you probably know, we have seasonal issues, seasonal requirements. Currently, those are winter uniforms, and this is something that we will touch on later. In the period from September 29th till October 5th, so basically last week, the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, in order to support the uh, Ukrainian armed forces, has uh, provided more than 14,000 body armor units, more than 17,000 helmets, more than 37,000 pairs of winter boots, more than 16,000 winter jackets, more than 34,000 winter hats, more than 67,000 uh, fleece jackets, jackets and 97 base layer suits, both demi-seasonal and winter suits. Overall, we are moving according to schedule. Based on the main items of uh, winter uniform that are being controlled by the Ministry of Defense, up until October 15th, we are supposed to supply the basic needs of most service members, and then we will move on towards uh, more specific needs. Some needs are completely covered already. For for example, the base layer suits needs, and some will be fulfilled by the end of the week. Until the end of uh, yesterday, according to our data, currently there were more than 100 sets of winter, 100,000 sets of winter uniform uh, on the loading docks or moving throughout the territory of Ukraine. It is something that was passed on to us by our foreign allies, but we know that this is something that will arrive very soon and will be um, distributed amongst the forces. So for us right now, the most important issue 
issues to uh, provide logistics. In regards to body armor and helmets, uh, our battle rhythm is uh, the usual. As of today, the Ministry of Defense has already created a reserve of more than 160,000 body armor. To summarize, in the issues of support, the Ministry of Defense is trying to tackle the issues that have previously arised only during the Second World War. In regards um, to monthly pay and benefits, this is something we usually brief you on. It's just the beginning of the month, but the Ministry of Defense has already financed 83% of monthly pay and benefits. That includes monthly pay, benefits for years of service, ranks, etc. As you probably remember, we are trying to also maintain a stable battle rhythm here in order to make sure that uh, we pay the basic pay to our service members in the first 10 days of the month, and in the second half of the month, we pay uh, the combat payments. We usually inform you on the informational warfare, on the informational domain. The war in the informational domain continues both in the east and in the south. Being unable to achieve significant success on the front line, the enemy continues to use the informational domain, media domain as an additional front line in order to create the necessary emotional and psychological uh, back ground in our society, meaning to create conditions that would enable the enemy to implement their goals. Different telegram channels have become a regular source of information for millions of Ukrainians. However, it is worth noting that amongst the uh, objective and useful telegram channels, there is a significant amount of propaganda channels that millions of Ukrainians subscribe to. We have published a list of these Russian telegram channels for a while. They're trying to camouflage themselves as pro-Ukrainian channels, and they're trying to pretend as if they publish information from the Ministry of Defense or the Office of the uh, President. We will publish this list again today. And I would like to address all Ukrainians to please practice informational hygiene and be critical about the information you consume from unofficial sources. As an example of narratives and informational campaigns Russia was working with last week, I'm going to tell you some more, but, and you'll realize that you've encountered that. The first narrative is that Kremlin is planning to deploy nuclear weapons. Russian propaganda continues to uh, make efforts in order to threaten the world with the potential use of nuclear weapons in response of the continuation of counteroffensive of the armed forces of Ukraine. Behind this threat is the desire of Moscow to freeze the conflict through negotiations. This message is actually distributed uh, through different channels and different media means, but overall this information campaign is boiled down to this nuclear threat. Another narrative that you've probably encountered is the military might of Russian Federation. We have noticed uh, that, tried to, that they're trying to force this narrative a lot stronger and uh, Russian propaganda channels are actively distributing um, messages on the undefeatability of Iranian drones and Putin's plans to provide the army with new uh, weapons, new equipment, which will make the Russian army so much stronger in combination with 200,000 of mobilized individuals. So once again, we see how Russian propaganda is trying to create myth and actively distribute those myths. It is important to understand that this information is an instrument of influence. It is an instrument of threatening the population, and it's also an instrument of influencing their own population. Yet another narrative that we have noticed is the topic of NATO. Last week, Russia quite actively engaged in the information warfare, especially uh, within the topic of 
Ukraine NATO relationships, and they've used uh, as one of the narratives Ukrainian application to NATO membership. Moreover, Russia is quite actively working in the Ukrainian information domain with information operations that is targeting the main narrative that Ukraine is economically weak. It will not be able to withstand the, uh, the economic impact. Um, the basis for this narrative are uh, the news on inflation, increased prices, lack of support from the West. Uh, there are also many messages about the nationalization of banks, calls to, to population to withdraw uh, cash, etc. But this is very important. We have to be critical about this information. Even without Russians, we are quite aware of the fact that Ukraine is still engaged in full-scale warfare, and it means that the economy simply cannot function at 100 percent. However, Ukrainian government organizations are working on supporting economical processes and ensuring their effective operations, and our Western partners continue to support us. At the same time, Russia is also focusing on the narrative that due to the economical issues in the West, in the winter, the West will abandon Ukraine completely. This is also a Russian fake, but they're not only launching it as separate news articles, they're launching it as an entire campaign. It is used by a gray propaganda when the facts are augmented by opinions. It is also quite interesting that the Russian Federation is spreading yet another narrative in regards to the current counteroffensive that the Ukrainian military is confidently performing. Russian troops are calling those demonstrative efforts, and they have actively started a campaign in which the Russian propaganda is trying to discredit Ukrainian counteroffensive and temporarily occupied territories using the notion that this counteroffensive is simply an attempt to create an illusion of success to lie to the Western partners and we all know that this is a lie, this is a myth, that in reality is something Russian Federation is using to speculate. Thank you so much for your attention. I would like to give the floor to the next briefer. This was Deputy Minister of Defense of Ukraine, Ms. Hanna Maler. I would like to give the floor to the Deputy Head of the Main Operations Director of the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, Brigadier General Alexei Hromov. Brigadier General, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. As of October 6, there have been no significant changes in the operational strategic situation. The situation is most difficult in the east of Ukraine. The aggressor has not abandoned their attempt to reach the state border of the Donetsk region. The enemy is actively trying to prevent Ukrainian forces from liberating the Kharkiv region completely. Russian troops are trying desperately to hold on to the occupied areas of Zaporizhia, Mykolaiv and Kherson Oblast. Overall, um, there were 168 engagements over this week in Volyn, Rivna, Zhytomyr, Chernihiv and Sumy Oblast. The situation is characterized as stable and controlled by the Ukrainian forces. The Ukrainian forces continue the stabilization operation in those oblasts. The military and political command of the Belarusia continues to provide aid to the aggressor in this operation against Ukraine. We have received information that within the bilateral agreement, the officers of the southern military district of the aggressor state are actively cooperating with Belarus, with Belarus in order to obtain different spare parts for vehicles and military equipment to supply the Russian uh, military forces. Moreover, since the beginning of October, uh, Belarusian military depots have uh, provided more than 30 wagons of ammunition to the Russian troops deployed in the east and south of Ukraine. Overall, since the beginning of aggression, there were 26 echelons 
with the overall number of more than 250 wagons and uh, more than 200,000 tons of ammunition that were supplied to Russian troops deployed in Ukraine. This morning, four Russian strategic bomber planes have uh, been deployed and have uh, conducted an air raid on Ukraine. Uh, last time the bomber planes were deployed from that direction was on August 28th. The Russian forces continue the disturbing fire targeting uh, Ukrainian troops positions and civilian infrastructure in the Kremyach. Chernihiv Oblast, Sredna Buda, Basivka, Shovchenkova, Velikova, Pasarivka, and other uh, settlements of Sumy Oblast. Over the course of this week, the enemy has not used aviation to deliver airstrikes along this axis. In Kharkiv Oblast, on Kupiansk and Svatova axis, the enemy is trying to prevent the counteroffensive and the forward movement of Ukrainian troops. Near Vetarinarne, Kazacha Lopat, Hopkivka, Zalecha and Zelene, the enemy attempted an assault operation, which was unsuccessful. The enemy targeted Ukrainian positions in near settlements of Kharkiv, Dvorichna, Shevchenkova, Rivkodub, Izumske, Druzhulubivka and others. And also delivered a missile strike on civilian infrastructure near the settlement of Ivashke. Since September 21st, Ukrainian forces have succeeded in moving forward by 55 kilometers behind the enemy defense lines, uh, reestablishing control over 93 settlements and achieving control over many square kilometers of Slobozhanshina. The enemy also attempted to advance near settlements of Bohorodivka, Spirna and Tirna, which were unsuccessful. The enemy delivered an aviation strike to Ukrainian positions near Belohorivka, Yampil, Spirna and missile strikes targeting Kramatorsk and Siversk. On Bakhmut, Texas, the enemy continues the offensive operation in the direction of Belohorivka, Solidar, Bakhmutske, Zaitseva, Atradivka, Makalaevka and Mayorsk. In order to push Ukrainian forces out from the acquired positions, Ukrainian defenders are heroically maintaining the defense of the occupied positions, limiting the efforts of the enemy. Ignoring the norms and principles of national humanitarian law, the enemy continues to systematically destroy civilian population and civilian infrastructure of the region. The enemy has delivered aviation strikes to Belohorivka, Solidar, Bakhmut, and missile strikes to Konstantinivka and Bakhmut. On Adivsk and Novopavlovsk axis, the enemy also uh, delivered aviation strikes to the Ukrainian position near Neversk, Marienka, Mohailevka, Vadyane, Trudove, Vesela and Prachistivka. On the Parisian axis, thanks to the uh, successful efforts of the Ukrainian defense forces, we forced the enemy to give up the attempts uh, of a counteroffensive. However, the adversary still continues to deliver aviation strikes in the areas near Novosilivka, Novopil, Drozhnyanka, Novodonilivka, Novoidarivka. And delivering missile strikes targeting civilian infrastructure near Vashneva, Zaporizhia, Hulaipola, Andrivka, and Dnipro. On the Kherson axis, using the reserves, the enemy is attempting counteroffensive in order to limit the efforts of Ukrainian troops in order to reoccupy the lost positions. From October 1st, we have gained control over 29 settlements. The occupational forces continue to systematically shell infrastructure in Mogolayev, Kherson, and Zaporizhia oblasts. In Morolubiv, Karhangelsk, Suhistov, Oktarnovi, Voda, Davidiv, Brit, airstrikes were delivered and missile strikes were delivered in Brzovat and Mikolaev. Since September 30th, the enemy has used 20 missiles of different types, including 13 uh, ballistic cruise missile launches. The enemy has also used, deployed 46 uh, kamikaze drones, Shahid-136, to target civilian infrastructure, military infrastructure, and positions. Out of them, 24 uh, drones were destroyed. This night, the air force of uh, Ukrainian armed forces destroyed 9 out of 12 kamikaze drones. Overall, since the beginning of the period of enemy deploying, 
These kamikaze drones, they have used 86. Kamikaze drones, out of them, 60% have been destroyed by the air defense. Considering the previous efforts, uh, we can assume that the enemy will continue to terrorize Ukrainian population using missile strikes, drones. The armed forces continue to secure the sky over Ukraine in order to minimize the uh, consequences of enemy shellings. However, we still call on to you to be safe during air raids. We will win. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much to the member of the General Staff. We had Brigadier General Oksiv Romov right here. I would like to give the floor to the representative of the National Guard of Ukraine, Colonel Mikola Urshalovich. Good afternoon. The forces and assets of the National Guard of Ukraine continue to carry out combat and special missions within the forces uh, of defense of Ukraine. Over the course of last week, the main efforts of the National Guard units in cooperation with other forces of the national defense and security sector were focused on assault operations and reoccupation of settlements of Novesh and Drygova de Lirilova. We have also conducted search and rescue, counter sabotage, uh, and other operations on the liberated territories. We have maintained defense positions on Kupiansk, Siversk, Avdiivka, Novopavlivka, and Zaporizhia axis on securing the state border and maintaining um, the martial law on the territory of Ukraine. The main efforts of our artillery were focused on supporting, providing fire support to the Ukrainian forces on Leman axis, which have assisted in the liberation of Leman, also in Belorivka axis, and targeting the enemy positions on the Parisia axis. We have carried out 121 fire missions targeting enemy um, personnel and weapon systems and vehicles. Over the course of last week, the artillery forces were able to destroy an ammunition depot of the enemy in the Zaporizhia Oblast. National Guard Aviation has continued to provide fire support medevac and providing uh, tr transport needs. The forces and assets of our National Guard reconnaissance have identified 269 enemy targets. National Guard continues to utilize lessons learned and forward practices uh, of drone deployment as a result of modernization and effective use of of drones to engage the enemy. We have identified and destroyed six enemy vehicles, one company level enemy depot and personnel of the enemy using our drone units. Beside the before mentioned enemy casualties, we have also neutralized uh, 29 uh, enemy personnel, two IFVs, two APCs, one vehicle and one enemy drone. We have also captured a T-72 tank, an APC, and also an MTLB of the enemies. National Guard, in order to provide security, defense, uh, and search and rescue operations to identify sabotage groups of the enemy, constantly engages uh, more than 139 K-9 specialists with the uh, specially trained dogs. Over the reporting period, we have also um, Process more than a thousand vehicles. Also near Hopkivka of Kharkiv Oblast, our service members have shot down a reconnaissance system Zala of the enemy. In order to ensure the martial law, uh, the National Guard forces are um, involved in 15 oblasts of Ukraine on 131 checkpoints and as a part of vehicle mounted and dismounted patrols. Over the course of last week, in order to carry out these missions, 
правопорушень було затримано 1566 institutions and 92 critical in, in infrastructure institutions. Moreover, the service members of the National Guard provide first medical aid to civilian population in the liberated areas of Ukraine. They continue to provide medication and evacuate seriously injured or ill citizens. The state continues to support the defenders of Ukraine. Thus, on October 3rd, in the Republic of Turkey, the head of the office of the President of Ukraine has awarded the service members of National Guard the defenders of Mariupol that have been liberated. Four service members of National Guard have achieved uh, the Star of Hero award from the, president, from the members of the President Office of Ukraine. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you to Colonel Mikola Urshalovich from the National Guard. Now I would like to give the floor to the representative of the National Police, Colonel Yuri Vychodits. Good afternoon. In the first few days of the war after the missile strikes in Ukraine, we have started to provide security to the personnel and provide technical means. We have deployed uh, centers to provide communication with other elements of the Ukrainian security and defense sector. And we started to engage in the most important missions that are important today as well. It has become obvious that the specialized skills of uh, our policemen are in need to support the population even during the time of war. According to the given tasks, the personnel started to work in the following domains. We have changed our our efforts. We have added an information line of effort, identifying and reacting to anti-Ukrainian propaganda, which is coordinated by pro-Russian mass media and bots and social media. We have added line of effort of spreading true information regarding the actual losses of the occupying forces and the inevitability of negative consequences to Russian forces, blocking available resources that the enemy is using to collect information regarding the positions of military units of Ukraine, countering Russian information troops on the Internet that are trying to launch attacks against the Ukrainian state websites as well as private sector, collecting information against that launched attacks on Ukrainian resources, restoring the operation of the recently added resources and collecting evidence of these attacks, searching for and identifying collaborators and other criminals from amongst the representatives of the so-called Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republics who actually participate in the war or support the war, identifying war crimes and blocking communication channels and funding of um, illegal armed formations. The police units started to participate in uh, the identification, documentation and investigation of war crimes or crimes against the statehood. We have started to develop mechanism to gather open source intelligence on uh, Russian military to assist the armed forces of Ukraine to optimize the processes of uh, the logistics processes and communication processes. We are actively assisting in processing uh, phones and computers of the Russian troops that we have acquired. In order to coordinate and effectively cooperate with other elements of the security forces and countering the Russian occupying forces, we have extended our cooperation with many other cybersecurity bodies. 
We have provided constant presence of the cyber police representatives and the general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine. We are also constantly cooperating with national cyber centers, business sector, and civil society. Educational institutions, all state bodies, and those citizens who uh, would like to assist in supporting the victory of Ukraine in this war. Internationally, we have established liaisons with many uh, allies and many entities that can assist the cyber police. We are also processing information on cyber attacks against the Ukrainian infrastructure. International cyber centers, Europol, Interpol, and diplomatic entities have responded uh, to our requests and helped us to block the work of international companies on the territory of Russia. Since the beginning of the war, we have sent requests to more than 450 companies on the territory of Russia that have partially or completely limited their services in Russia. Policemen from the cyber police have identified more than 14,000 of service members of the Russian Federation who actively participated in committing the war crimes on the territory of Ukraine. We are currently investigating 480 cases of war crimes. We have also identified 82 collaborators, identified 170 members of the illegal armed formations. Some of them participated both in active combat and also in funding of the war. Within the framework of uh, cooperation of the aforementioned allies in the cryptocurrency markets, we have uh, carried out measures to limit the cryptocurrency that is used to support uh, the occupational activities on the temporarily occupied territories and uh, funding of the entities related to Russian Federation that are included in the sanction lists of the EU and the United States of America. As a result, we have blocked the operations of more than 170 crypto wallets. We continue to receive and protest uh, claims of citizens. We have received more than 22,000 of these claims. Separately, we have started on uh, gathering important information to counter Russian aggression. Since the beginning of the war, we have created a service called Narodny Masnak. And through that service, we have received more than 28,000 claims on suspicious activity, 1,050 claims on um, instances of looting, and more than 501 claims on uh, collaboration activities. This information is being processed and then later transferred to the responsible entities within the security sector of Ukraine. I would like to separately highlight our project MRIA, which brought together more than five unique services. Additional information on every service you can find on the website MRIA Social. In brief, this is a platform that has existed for quite a while. Its historical name is Stop Drugs. More than five years, Interested citizens continue, continue their efforts to block telegram channels that used to illegally sell drugs. But in the beginning of the war, this project was reformatted to combat Russian fakes and propaganda. This is a joint project of uh, the security services and volunteers. The main aim of this project right now is to counter enemy propaganda. The main strength of this community are our followers. They help us to counter to Russian aggression on the internet. Today, the project brought together more than 750,000 individuals who have blocked more than 14,000 enemy resources that were spreading disinformation and propaganda. The overall target audience of these blocked resources constitutes 67 million subscribers. We have this destroyed 1,500 communication channels that were used to gather information on the positions of Ukrainian troops. We have also gathered information on 70,000 uh, enemy resources. 
Another priority of the cyber police is also uh, identifying and assisting in stopping crimes. Another important area is uh, fighting the spread of child pornography. We have identified 200, uh, 23 pedophiles as a result of, these, of the crimes of these perpetrators. 48 children became victims. As a result uh, of investigative activities, we have obtained 30 terabytes of illegal information. We have prevented uh, more than 390 cyber attacks against the civilian sector and assisted with mitigation efforts on 94 instances of cyber attacks. A separate uh, field that we focus on is uh, countering organized criminal activity. We have liquidated 21 organized crime groups, uh, three drug-related organized groups, um, two content-related, and others. There were 75 perpetrators in those uh, organized crime groups. Despite the active Russian aggression against Ukraine, there is still an increased number of claims of citizens against Against instances where uh, people are trying to uh, steal money through deception. For example, instances where people, under false pretenses, try to steal money by pretending to lease apartments, to assist people with transportation from the temporarily occupied areas. Also, there were quite important schemes where uh, individuals promised uh, to help people cross the border, even though it is uh, illegal for men of the drafting age. Since the beginning of the war, there are more than 800 instances uh, of these crimes being perpetrated using the informational technologies. The losses... Uh, amount to more than 15 million hryvnia, 24 of which have already been repaid. Over the course of last week, cyber police has discovered a large-scale uh, boat farms that spread fakes on the war on Ukraine. The organizers of these boat farms have uh, engaged the citizens of uh, Russian Federation and the temporarily occupied territories to creating bots. The perpetrators were paid in rubles through the payment systems prohibited in Ukraine. These fake pages were used to spread fake information and propaganda in the form of posts and comments on social media. In particular, in order to spread fake information on their own aggression of the Russian Federation in order to justify the occupation of the Ukrainian territories. Moreover, the perpetrators <laughs> have advertised phishing pages. The perpetrators genera generated more than 3,000 fake accounts per week. The overall the bot farm consisted of 50,000 bots. We collected more than 35,000 SIM cards of Ukraine and other states. We have opened criminal proceedings on the case. To summarize, I would like to highlight that internet is also a battlefield, and Ukrainian victory is only possible through cooperation and mutual trust. Thank you so much for your attention. That was Colonel Yuri Vyhodits, the National Police of Ukraine. Thank you so much. I would like to invite our speakers to the stage and have the mass media representatives ask questions. Please ask questions one by one. Good day, Volodymyr Polishchuk, Army Inform. I have a question. Is the representative of the National Guard? 
Colonel, sir, um, engineer forces of the National Guard of Ukraine, do they carry out the mining efforts? If so, then uh, where and what are the results of their efforts? Thank you so much for your question. As of today, the issue of the mining in the National Guard is actually an issue that is in focus. We have established and deployed more than 30 demining teams. They are distributed throughout every battalion task force, company task force, so in every battalion task force and company task force, there is a demining team. Moreover, Kharkiv access is reinforced by five demining teams that provide demining efforts on the liberated territories. Weekly, the statistics is uh, we discover more than 1,500 explosives. This week, more than 1,600 potentially dangerous explosives were discovered and destroyed. Over the entire time of the full, since the beginning of the full-scale aggression, more than 17,000 of explosives were uh, neutralized. Dear colleagues, next question, please. Nikita Halka, Suspilna. I have a question to the representatives of the general staff and the armed forces. I have two questions. The first question regarding the right the bank of Kherson Oblast. We don't really hear any news regarding the ponton bridges that the enemy is trying to deploy there and what is the situation of the enemy units in that uh, area of responsibility. Thank you for your question. The enemy continues their efforts uh, in terms of restoring the logistics support of the forces that are currently trying to prevent Ukrainian troops from liberating um, Ukrainian land. The enemy is attempting to establish a chain of supply through pontoon bridges, through steamboats, through anything, but every option they choose, we know how to fight back against. Our missile troops continue to engage the, tar the enemy targets. You see the situation from the media. You can see that along this line of effort, the enemy doesn't have an advantage, and Ukrainian troops continue to liberate the temporarily occupied territories. Thank you for your question. We also have another question regarding the kamikaze drones that the enemy started to actively use as well as in the depths of Ukrainian territory. Is there a reason for us to say that the number of these drones, the number of these attacks will increase? How can we combat these attacks? For example, in Bila Tsarkva, in Kharkiv, in other regions of Ukraine, the enemy is using these drones and they actually reach the targets. How can we counter them? Thank you for your question. Yes, the enemy is using kamikaze drones. Last week during the briefing, I have informed uh, the population that the enemy used 29 kamikaze drones, but out of them we shot down 10. That was one third. As of today, I have told you that the enemy has deployed 86 kamikaze drones, and we have shot down 60% of those. We are improving our air defense. Taking into consideration the characteristics of enemy drones, these drones are uh, a little slower than missiles, and so they're more subjected to different types of fire engagement. Today, when shooting down these drones, we have utilized both the aviation of the Air Force, air defense, and small arms. And the results, as I have already told you, are the 86 kamikaze drones, 60% of those were shut down. We are continuing to improve our efforts in terms of both air defense 
and means and ways of countering these specific drones. Thank you. Sir, Ukrainform Irina Koshukhar, to end the drone topic, we have previously received news that these drones have been launched from the south of Ukraine. Are there any other launch directions from Belarus, for example, or from Russian territory? And if you have analyzed the targets that are mostly struck by these drones, what are the statistics there? And my second question is to Ms. Hanna Mahler regarding the information front. The recent posts of, that, of Elon Musk on Twitter, do you think that can be considered an information attack against Ukraine? Thank you. In regards to the deployment of drones, Yes, the enemy continues to deploy these drones from temporarily occupied territory of Crimea. The main intelligence department has had some in operational information that it is possible that these drones have been delivered to the Belarusian territory. We are closely monitoring the situation. As I have told you, Air defense systems have been augmented to take into consideration the challenges. The enemy is targeting both military and civilian infrastructure to create panic among the population. Thank you. We have to ask Elon Musk, you know, what he meant by posting those things on Twitter. Uh, for us, the world is Ukraine center, right? But for the world, it's something different. Next question, please. Just recently received news that the head of the Federation Council of Russia, Valentina Matvienka, have suggested um, for the Ukrainian delegation to the G20 in Indonesia to start negotiations. I know that this is not a question that should be addressed to you, but I would like to take this opportunity to ask you for a comment. And fortunately, I'm not authorized to comment on the actions of Valentina Matvienko. Thank you. Tatiana Maros, Army Inform. Tatiana Maros, Army Inform. Army Inform. I have a question to Mr. Alexey Gromov. We know that tomorrow is Putin's birthday. What are the expectations of the Russian, for the Russian troops tomorrow? Thank you for the question. Taking into consideration the weird obsession with dates or sacred symbols of our enemy. We remember that on Ukrainian Independence Day, the enemy used all types of equipment in order to deliver a barrage fire to cause panic and cause massive casualties for both civilian and military infrastructure. Of course, we do not exclude the possibility that the enemy will try to celebrate the birthday of their leader, maybe that will be something he will command on, maybe that will be the decision made by Russian military commanders, if that will be something, uh, some decisions made by the Russian military commanders, we would wish for them to fail, surely, and uh, to later be fired, of course. But for our service members, it will be yet another day. It will be yet another day of them fulfilling their duty. The only thing is they will try to give the enemy as many possibilities as possible to visit the concert of Kobzon. I have a question to the head of the Cyber Police Department. The first question is, have you seen and increase in the in the fraud cases, right, the number of uh, fraud instances has not increased, however, uh, the types of fraud cases has changed. People are trying fraudulent activities related to uh, transportation of individuals from temporarily occupied territories, etc. However, I would like to highlight that we are quite effective in identifying these perpetrators are constantly 
uh, in the focus um, of our activities. And my second question is, is there any chance to bring Russian hackers who are attacking Ukrainian resources to court? We are actively documenting in different evidence on hacker groups, including from the Russian Federation, that have attacked Ukrainian infrastructure and the private sector. As of today, uh, we have agreements with our international partners that whenever we identify um, Russian hackers and whenever they will try to cross Russian borders, they will be detained according to the international law and the pretrial investigations will start. Next question, please. Dear colleagues, since there are no more questions, I would like to remind you this was Military Media Center, the single information platform of the defense and security sector of Ukraine. Thank you so much for being here and see you at our next briefing.